Welcome to Lunch with Greentown. This is a five-week series of talks on environmental topics of interest. Greentown Los Altos is your local environmental group founded over 10 years ago. We have fun planting trees and we will plant number 200 this month. We also have a summer internship program and we really enjoy working with the next generation. We also take an interest in policy issues and we'll advocate for the things that we think are important, such as the REACH codes last year. Switching away from fossil fuels is a priority for us. These talks take about one hour and there will be time for questions. I use the chat function to ask your questions and I'll keep an eye on that to the best of my abilities. And uh, the talks are recorded and will eventually be posted on our YouTube channel. A big thank you to Los Altos Parks and Rec Department for their help in hosting this series. And another shout out to the Sereno Group. They provided the funds for our outreach with a grant from their 1% for Good Climate and Culture Fund. Thank you. And now let's begin. Uh, Jason McKinney works at Hidden Villa and he's gonna tell us about their farming practices that regenerate the landscape while producing food for the local community. Jason, you're up. So you have, uh, you can go to screen share now and show your slides. Okay, uh, will do. I'll just introduce myself a little bit more formally to begin with, but uh, welcome everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jason McKenney and uh, I manage uh, together with my partner, Lynette Anderson, the farming operations, uh, the vegetables, fruits and flowers portion of Hidden Villas Agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm just going to go through uh, a lot of uh, the different methods that we use today and try and give you guys an overview about, um, about a lot of our practices. Uh, and suffice to say, to begin with that, um, that a lot of these things are really works in progress. And um, in having managed a small scale organic farm, uh, for a bunch of years now, we've really discovered that there's a, an important essential nature in really seeking out sustainability to have an open mind and kind of an open heart to the practice of things. Um, so uh, that's what we're striving for. So uh, let's go with some slides here. Uh, okay, I am... Okay. Are you getting that? Great. Yeah, that's great. Cool. <clears throat> so, just to begin with some like somewhat like uh, pessimistic stuff. Um, so that we're all clear on the idea that commercial agriculture as it is practiced today uh, represents actually a little bit more than 98% of all the agriculture in the world. And uh, it's definitely something that uh, we as uh, Western countries have, uh, in my opinion, unfortunately exported to much of the rest of the world. Uh, that kind of commercial agriculture is, uh, in climate change terms, the second largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. And in raw pollution terms, it is the biggest non-point source of pollution in the world. Uh, that being water, air pollution, and soil pollution. Um, I've deliberately given these two images here of commercial agriculture um, as you know, two separate brands effectively of commercial agriculture, which really indicate uh, one you know, kind of central premise to a lot of commercial agriculture as it's practiced, which is just the idea of monoculture. And uh, in monoculture, it's, it's essentially applying an industrial mindset to view food production, really any agricultural production, as a manufacturing process. And in so doing, what you do is you separate 
um, by producing just one thing here in this upper picture, it's just chickens. Um, and in the lower picture, it's just soybeans. And when you try to distill a natural environment that you're producing within down to just a single production, what you do is you end up creating all of these, these different ecological problems. I think there's an awesome, uh, the, the words of uh, author and farmer Wendell Berry has an awesome way of putting this, uh, just saying that commercial agriculture takes a solution and neatly divides it into two problems. Uh, <laughs> what, what he means by that is that it's, when you have a monoculture mindset to your approach of producing things, then you're, you're, taking a, you're, you're taking all of the waste products and all of the problems that might be inherent within that production and you're concentrating them and making them into ecological problems because you've separated from them from what would be a more natural cyclical process um, in, in viewing nature. Um, so let's see. Um, it is, you know, more optimistically possible to uh, to adapt a kind of productive agriculture that fits into the environment and actually has an effect of enhancing our natural environment. Oh, come on, slides. Okay, there we go. Um, so there's uh, we practice what we call regenerative agriculture at Hidden Villa. And uh, this is a picture here of uh, the opening to our farm fields. Um, in strict terms at Hidden Villa, we are a certified organic operation, but um, just so that you're all clear on it, organic certification really only constitutes uh, making rulings and, um, and having uh, monitoring of the use of synthetic chemicals on a farm. And there really isn't that much more that goes into the label of organic. And you see this when you, uh, you know, for the vast majority of organic food that you would find at a grocery store is, uh, is produced on farms that are technically organic, but the vast majority of those farms also produce things commercially. Um, I think that there's there's been a lot of, especially in the last 15 years or so, been just a tremendous amount of greenwashing that goes into the images presented about organic. And um, basically, I, there's, there's a, a utility for the sellers of organic products for consumers for you to think that, it's, that organic means a lot of things that it does not. Um, organic basically means that you don't use synthetic chemicals in its production. It means that you don't use genetically modified organisms in its production. Uh, it means that you don't use uh, human sewage waste in its production. It really doesn't mean very much more than that. Um, we find that at Hidden Villa to be really insufficient uh, in, in talking about and thinking about agriculture. Um, we are evolving our production to adopt what are increasingly being classified as uh, regenerative methods. And um, it's, this is really a growing movement in agriculture. It's not a certified movement. Um, basically, it's a way of adapting a wide variety of methods that were first developed and refined by many different indigenous cultures from around the world. There's uh, there's native North, Central and South Americans, African people, Southeast Asian and Pacific Island cultures that all developed incredibly rich histories of self-sufficient agricultural practice that long, long predates colonial history. Um, in fact, the, the first people that were on our land at Hidden Villa, uh, the Ohlone Ramatush, they lived in such harmony with their natural environment that they foraged every single thing they needed and to really just thrive in the entire Bay Area without any need for agriculture practice at all. Um, they did this for, for thousands and thousands of years. And in, in 
my mind at least that's what sustainability is about um that sustainability it comes through the recognition of connection and relationship to land uh and that's a relationship that's really about give and take not not just take <laughs> okay um so these are you know just kind of a rough listing of uh what are i think fairly commonly viewed as tenants for regenerative agriculture. Um, it's looking at things through a biological lens. Uh, so much of the, the problems associated with commercial agriculture have come from a really reductionist mindset in uh, viewing the processes that go on in a soil system uh, as just a physical or a chemical one and seeing like, oh, these plants, they have they don't have all the chemicals they need. So let me give them the chemicals. Well, in fact, it's really about the soil biology that's there. Um, the, the soil food web, as it is often known, is really, it constitutes a, a almost unfathomable amount of different organisms that live within every single soil system, even the unhealthy ones. Um, and those organisms, are what actually convey nutrients, their metabolism, everything about their life cycle in terms of their volume and their diversity is what makes for fertility in a soil system. Um, that kind of hints at this other notion that biodiversity is really the key to resilience within any of these systems. Um, that one, you know, at Hidden Villa, we always strive to, um, to teach by demonstration and uh, so we'll, we'll show the ways that nature basically mirrors diversity always. It's, uh, it's, it's a natural progression of living things that they tend towards diversity. And the, the food web that is within the soils mirrors the food web that you see in a forest system, the food web, or I'm calling it food web, just a web of life really that you see in oceans, in deserts, all ecosystems on earth have an ever increasing evolving diversity there. And so that diversity is really in, in trying to mirror that diversity, it's key to having an agriculture practice that can deal with the, the shifts and changes and um, you know, the, the issues that we come upon uh, through certainly a changing climate um, as well as other changes that we experience in our environment. Um, in generalized terms, that means that the tools that we have for, uh, for adapting this kind of agriculture, they all have to do with us being open to the observation and the learning that can come from our natural environment. Uh, we'll go into a bunch of different ways in which that comes clear. So, this is a picture of um, our interns from last year, uh, Katie and Lance, uh, going through the process of our uh, thermophilic pile composting. Um, this is, this is uh, loading up materials into a tool that chews them up and spits them out the back. Katie's back there putting water down on the piles of this. But the materials that are going into this are all of the different waste residues that we have on the ranch here. And that's, <clears throat> that's animal manures, it's animal bedding, it's crop residues, it's green waste from people's kitchens, it's green waste from programs that we conduct here at Hidden Villa. All of those materials go into our compost piles and primarily are decomposed by aerobic bacteria and uh, some fungi. Uh, and that bacterial action is what builds up the heat in those piles, which assists in the further like kind of primary, secondary, tertiary decompositions that occur within those materials. Um, this is not a mysterious process. So, I mean, I guess it's, it's really cool if you get down into the minutia of it, but um, but not mysterious in the sense that most organic farms use compost. Uh, compost, when it is 
uh, materials made from fully decomposed organic matter always have a benefit to soils. And um, most farms apply compost with regularity to their, their field areas before planting into them. Um, not uncommon. It is uncommon, however, what we do at Hidden Villa is composting all of the materials that we have on site. And that represents a, a tremendous nutrient recycling. And um, it's also something I would ask you to consider. Uh, it's really bolstering of the particular local soil food web that we have. Um, it's a bit more of a nuanced point, but <clears throat> one that we have found to be really important um, is that when we use this variety of what they call feedstocks, the kind of the material you put into a compost pile, um, we use, we use uh, manures that come from, you know, five or six different types of animals, all kinds of bedding materials that go into that of straw, wood chips, things along those lines. We use just, you know, crop residues from literally hundreds of different crops and kitchen waste from all these different um, people's kitchens, as well as uh, from the programs that we have here. All of those ingredients come together with a diversity of microorganisms that are all locally present here. And it makes it so that those things proliferate. And then it makes the compost that we're then applying to the fields later on something that is really beneficial for the whole soil food web. And it's also an addition of a lot of carbon material to the soil, which has just a physical quality of nutrient water retention, uh, just this really porous spongy material that really helps in building an ever increasing fertility in the soils. Um, let's see. Uh, So yeah, again, that is one of you know many practices that are mirroring what nature does, because you know nature has its own way of taking poop and turning it into something useful, rather than having it be a waste product. Um, I will note that we are not as yet incapable of recycling human waste here. Um, Another really important regenerative method is cover cropping. You see here in this picture, that, uh, we have a mixture of different uh, legumes that are growing in one of our main field areas. Uh, in the foreground there, you can really see some peas. For those of you gardeners out there, I'm sure you can identify them. Uh, but actually all of these things uh, we have within this cover crop are pea varieties. Um, <clears throat> now, I, it's, cover cropping is, is really much, uh, much more generally applicable. And um, for, you know, to my own heart, it's just like, I couldn't say enough good things about cover cropping. It's the coolest thing ever. Um, it's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's just, the, the tactic is not just about, um, it's not, well, I'll back up from that. It's, it's something that is one of the best mirrors of natural process because we all know from every place, every natural space that we, we go to, nature doesn't maintain just open bare soils in places. Um, nature always has plants growing in any soil system. I mean, maybe the exception of beach sand or something like that. But it, it, I mean, right down to the point that we define soil as dirt that's growing things. You know, that's um, that's how we look at uh, at the living world around us. And the whole premise of cover crops is about keeping that soil covered, and that has all of these beneficial effects. It it prevents erosion. It accelerates nutrient uptake, um, really from the entire soil profile. Uh, and recycles those nutrients through it matter with the soil systems, which have more of that effect of creating a, a good uh, beneficial sponge there inside of the soils, uh, what they call humic matter. 
And uh, that, that helps retain more nutrients and retain more water. Um, cover crops help with the distribution of water throughout a soil system. Um, so you know, Jason, we, we've got a whole lecture coming up on cover crops. So this is, this is good stuff. But for those who are, are interested, be sure to tune in on March 25th. Woohoo! Well, I'll be there. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's just it, for our purposes. Um, you know what we what we really like to recognize in our cover crops is their a, a unique ability among the leguminous cover crops, the pea varieties that we plant, at fixing nitrogen. Um, if there's just a little review for that process uh, for folks who maybe don't know, um, the particularly pea varieties are really adept at establishing a mutual relationship with uh, soil bacterium called rhizobium bacteria. And this is, uh, it's a relationship where the plants effectively provide the, the shelter and the food for these bacteria and, uh, and the bacteria undergo the, the really energy intensive process of taking atmospheric nitrogen and making it into plant available forms. Um, that, the reason why this is important is, you know, has everything to do with like, what are the biggest nutritive scarcities that you experience in any productive soil system? Farmers are always worried about nitrogen. It's <laughs> always an issue like, uh, you know, 99 times out of 100 on, uh, in agricultural situations, um, be they commercial or organic, one of the biggest issues is that there's not enough nitrogen for the plants. And that makes uh, this ability to utilize cover crops for the effect of generating uh, fertility in the soil system, just such an incredibly important thing. You can see in this picture, there are on the, <clears throat> the root system, those little bumps that are there, those are known as the nodules. Um, they're effectively an enlargement, um, almost like a gall that grows on the root system to house the rhizobium bacteria. And uh, inside of those, those nodules, the plant provides sugars that it derives from its photosynthesis to power the really energetic intensive process of taking atmospheric nitrogen, breaking these triple covalent bonds that it's got in it and, um, and making it into plant available forms. <laughs> Those forms of the nitrogen are really, they're channeled through the soil food web, through a mostly bacteria, but some fungi to make them available to plants. Um, so there's really just an intense interaction of these, you know, as I was saying before, these biological things, not the chemical ones, not the physical ones exactly. I mean, they play factors, but it's really about a biological process for generating fertility. But the reason why cover cropping is so scalable and so important in this manner is that most of the pollution that commercial agriculture is responsible for is because of its consumption of fossil fuels that is because of its production of commercial fertilizers. Um, commercial fertilizers have, have for decades been the biggest consumer of natural gas um, increasingly a big consumer of coal. And so the correspondingly, the kinds of greenhouse gas emissions that have come from agriculture and its production of fertilizers have been nothing short of catastrophic. And this kind of practice is something that even commercial growers can be doing in order to generate more so soil fertility. And that makes it something that's really solar powered fertility. So uh, no fossil fuels needed. Okay. This picture is really part of um, just a small shot of the way they grow things at Hidden Villa. Um, You'll notice, I'll encourage you to notice in here that what you have is a, um, 
is a standard uniform bed size uh, on which there's you know, superimposed this kind of tapestry of different crops that are growing, multiple levels of crops, uh, different times of maturity for those crops, um, you know, some of them being harvested at different times. And uh, this is really a representation of one of the uh, central tenants to, uh, to good regenerative growing, which is working on the process of crop rotations and successions. And this is absolutely something that's very applicable on a home garden scale as well. Um, I'll ask you to, to try and see in here that what's going on is that we have, uh, you know, just in this one photograph alone, there's like, you know, well over a dozen varietals of different things that are growing and they're at different growth stages. Um, and what you get in that is in just practical nuts and bolts terms, is a bigger diversity of plant life feeding a larger diversity of the soil food web. And, and in growing in that way, what you do is uh, you, you utilize nutrients more efficiently, you cycle through nutrients better, you minimize pest problems, um, whether they be like insect problems, fungal problems, uh, even to some degree, the problems that you might have with, uh, with different vertebrates. Um, that happens by having just as it is in nature, a diversity of things growing. So there isn't just, you know, one way of thinking about monoculture is it's just totally vulnerable. It's totally brittle because it's this huge energetic reserve that can just be like destroyed by any one thing. Diversity in nature creates a uh, balance that is more resilient, that is, is less vulnerable to the kinds, of, um, the kinds of pest problems. When we call them problems, it's a very like, you know, anthropocentric way of thinking about it. Um, they're not exactly problems. There's basically something we created by trying to have such a monocultural mindset to how we would see things. Um, yeah. The, Successions too, I say in that are really important too, because what you learn in the process of do, of conducting rotations and um, and it really is a, a a humble process that requires observation over time to adapt these kinds of tactics and uh, and what you learn over time is things that follow other things um, in order to say you know for example, having a mustard family crop growing in an area is going to have a suppressive effect on a lot of pathogenic fungi. And so you could know that something like the nightshade family, including tomatoes, um, would, be, would be really vulnerable to fungal problems. And in growing nightshades after growing mustards, then you actually protect those tomatoes from the kinds of fungal problems that they might experience. Um, just one tiny example of those kinds of things that, that really represent having rotations and successions that help to create greater diversity in the field and more of this resilience. <clears throat> Additionally, the crop diversity, especially in the form of uh, flower species, just has a, a huge layer of protection and ecological strength by attracting all of these beneficial predatory insects. Um, it, it does so because the flowers provide a nectary for, for feeding of the beneficial insects. Uh, a lot of those beneficials, they, they eat nectar and they eat bugs. Um, and it just provides an overall habitat and that's really how we try to view regenerative agriculture pr uh, practice is that we're creating habitat for more organisms. And in, in doing that, you get all of these benefits in terms of the predation and the balance that gets created by beneficial insects. And you get uh, all of the, the, what they call pollination services, you know, which I always think is kind of a funny one, you know. Um, most beekeepers in California like actually like migrate their hives 
over to orchard spaces that are monocultural orchards in order to provide pollination services. Um, it's a it's a huge business in uh, in California agriculture. Um, when you practice methods of diversity and regeneration on farms, you you get that pollination service for free. Um, it just basically happens by cultivating the the natural biodiversity that's present in not just honeybees, but in native bees as well. Um, okay, so. We've got a picture here of uh, some of our pigs uh, and they're, they're out, uh, these are, these pigs are probably just about three months old or so. And um, we do a lot of, can somebody, can you mute that please? Yeah, I just, I just got that. Thank you. Um, we do a whole lot of different forms of, uh, of integrating animals into our production uh, for, for everything really at Hidden Villa. And, um, and it, it's it, it basically the the technical terms they have for this they call it multi-species rotational grazing um, which kind of sounds like a mouthful but um we found in really raw practical terms that the the kinds of things that benefit us the most are um for example taking chickens and pigs and having them range through a crop after we finished our last harvest last harvest and that gives, that gives the, the pigs and the chickens an ability to forage on their own. They live this healthier, more active lifestyle where they're like getting to migrate through and follow all of their natural behaviors. Um, but at the same time, they're foraging on crop residue and suppressing weeds within those areas. And then they're, they're producing manure within those soil areas that then we can, we can migrate them out of and give time for the decomposition naturally within that soil food web in the area in order to replenish the soils and make for what is effectively a good rotation then into something else growing within that land area. Um, we have done uh, ruminants, sheep, goats, and cows um, ranging through cover cropped areas that will grow within more of uh, field grasses, um, oats, barley principally we've done. And those kinds of situations, we get uh, a really effective bolstering of organic matter and of just basically raw carbon within the soils. And uh, those ruminants, you know, same thing, are benefiting by the production of their manure within those areas. Um, you contrast those notions to like what a lot of uh, confined animal feeding operations do, which in terms of the energetic inputs of moving food from a whole other place to the place where the animals are. You know, this is a system, these are a variety of systems of integrating those things together why not move the animals to where the food is and let them feed for themselves? Uh, in the example of this picture, it's one of the, um, one of the fresher and, um, and to my mind, like, like one of the really cool kind of pioneering things that, uh, that the pigs are capable of. Um, we have begun in recent years doing very, very deep uh, wood chip mulches through certain areas of the field. Um, we did this initially in a couple of areas of really, really marginal ground, um, areas that had been, uh, that just had never been effective growing areas and where we really were having a struggle with um, just some of the lowest nutrient levels and just, you know, terrible soil conditions, um, both biologically uh, and, you know, physically. And we put down uh, just raw wood chips, these kind of ramial wood chips, they're called. As, um, they've been, you can see the uh, particle size on them is relatively small. And um, <clears throat> it's a lot of different arborist waste that in uh, most, most cases is actually only a landfill. Uh, and 
we brought that down into like, in some cases, like three, four foot thick applications of it. And we leave it in place for two years. And in the process of that two years, uh, it gets irrigation, it gets um, rainfall on it and undergoes what we have found to be a largely uh, fungal decomposition. You can tell by the amount of, uh, of you know, different hyphae that are produced within those wood chips. And, uh, and then at the same time, we've brought pigs out there. Um, you can see there's an electric fence that the pigs mostly abide, you know, sometimes they get out and go for kind of, you know, joy rides elsewhere. Um, but they stay within this fence area on the wood chips, which gives them a really great space to forage in and root and demonstrate a lot of their natural behaviors. And um, in the process of that, they're working up the wood chips, helping to degrade them. The deposition of their manure is making for a faster and, um, and more, in terms of the, the local soil food web, a more appropriate decomposition of those materials in place. And it's a long-term way then of, of developing a soil system that, um, that has a greater degree of fertility to it. We've increasingly come to utilize this method. Um, here you can see a picture of uh, one of the one of the fresher areas that we've applied these wood chips to, that hasn't even been um, that has, hasn't even been foraged or walked on by the pigs, and that carbon, contrary to what is like considered like conventional soil uh, science wisdom about it. Um, that has really added a lot of nitrogen to our soils over enough time. There's generally, um, it's generally thought that when you do large carbon uh, applications to soils, um, <clears throat> that it will uh, deplete the nitrogen within those soils and make it worse in general for plants to live. Um, we're pretty much just guessing here about why this hasn't been the case, why it's actually developed nitrogen there. Certainly one of the factors in it is having pigs range in these areas. Um, another one we think is probably because the decomposition that these materials are going through is primarily a fungal one. Um, and that coupled with the notion of the wood chips being on the soil surface, not being incorporated into Soil. We're not turning them in. Um, they're just on the surface. They're put there, a thick layer of them. They get rained on and they're there for a very long time. Um, that it's some, some grouping of those attributes has made it something that's been a tremendous soil building uh, for us here on the farm. And um, <clears throat> so Jason, I'm going to cut in here if you don't mind. It's, yeah, uh, sure. It is 1240 and I know we've got some Good questions. People probably have more questions. This is really interesting, by the way. I'm enjoying it immensely. Um, all right. So one, I'll just give you some questions. You pick the ones you want to answer, but okay, is this cool. kind yeah. of, I haven't is, been seeing those. Sorry, Anson. Yeah, that's no problem. One would be is this kind of operation scalable? It would be nice if it could be. Uh, what are you doing in terms of uh, a warmer climate? Are you doing experiments to look at uh, what practices and crops would? be applicable. Uh, what animal, we saw the lovely pictures of the pigs. You probably can't have pigs in your residential property, but maybe chickens and other things. You know what, what animals are legal? And one final thought, you have students come out uh, for your classes and in, in your training. Uh, is, this, is this pretty, are they pretty receptive to this kind of uh, approach? Um, great, okay, that's, uh, that's a lot. Um, it is a lot, sorry. <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe Gary, you could help review some of the, like, I'll try to, um, yeah. Is it scalable? Yeah. Um, it, it is scalable primarily in cover crop terms. Um, but I'll ask you to consider the question. I want to push back on that one. Um, scalability as a term is something that's assigned to a, to try and evaluate an economic viability to something. And 
think that scalability really in reference to actually adhering to the, the needs of an ecosystem and biology really needs to be fundamentally questioned. Um, scalable, uh, this practice needs to be small scale for it to be effective. Um, and so the scalability to my mind really comes through more people farming, more people farming this way. And to that effect, that's for years, Hidden Villa has, uh, has had an internship where we're explicitly training young farmers to follow these kinds of practices, to bring that information, to bring that practice to other farms and follow it in other localities. Um, uh, nice we, need to, we need to remake a farm system for this country. And that it's, it's, you're never going to be able to follow and adhere biological practices in a way that's on thousands and thousands of acres as a single farm. The, the economy will always push you in other directions and make you cut corners. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. Uh, let's see, what else did we have? What, what, what animals are legal? If we wanted to have an animal at home? Uh, pretty much just chickens. Just chicken, um, yeah, I kind of thought but, so. Uh, but Mark, who I think is in this group, had a fun experience with some sheep and goats in his backyard in Los Altos. Um, that uh, that we had to, we had a mandatory evacuation of our farm animals during some of the fire crises that we experienced last year that resulted in having some animals uh, in Los Altos. Uh, <clears throat> seemed like it went mostly well but it was a little crazy, mostly for the practical purposes of people in Los Altos. I think that there might be, some, I'm not clear on the restrictions in Los Altos Hills um, and what they are. Um, and maybe somebody else could chime in with that. But I know that in Los Altos proper, uh, it's just chickens that are allowable. Not, e not even goats, okay. So, Getting back to the uh, reverse of the scalability question, now, presumably this is something that anybody in their backyard could do. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, it's really just about um, it's it's really just about having a different context for the for the growing. And you know, as I was saying before, like trying to uh, hone your observational qualities and experiment with things and think about them in terms of the biology. So, you know, these different processes for mirroring nature, um, you know, mulch, I, I can't, I have a hard time imagining any gardeners that don't already employ mulching techniques. Um, you know, gardeners should absolutely be uh, keeping their ground, your garden covered at all times, whether that's in mulches, whether that's in plants. Um, a lot of gardeners I found haven't, um, haven't explored a lot of cover cropping. Um, but it's, it works fantastically in gardens. Strongly encourage people um, okay. cover cropping. Um, uh, FYI, maybe everybody's seen this, but Linda says in Los Angeles, you are allowed one goat or sheep per 10,000 square feet of land. There you go. Woo! <laughs> All right. Pet goat. And a neighbor of mine in Los Altos Hills had a cow. Get out. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So somebody, Gary, somebody's also asking, um, Diane's also asking, how is this applicable to our suburban, say, 48 square foot raised beds? Um, rotate a quarter legumes, a quarter flowers, a quarter rotating veggies. And can we use purchased chicken manure? And somebody else asked, do you have manure, Hidden Villa? We have manure. I would not advise using raw manure in any circumstance. Um, that's... Uh, it's dangerous potentially for primarily the soil organisms because uh, concentrations of manure are just such a kind of an unnatural thing to present to a garden bed or any soil system um, just in their raw concentrated form. And uh, so, yeah, composting them is really the right procedure to go through. Um, I don't necessarily want to overwhelm us if that's going to be the case, but we have a lot of compost here. Uh, if people are interested in that. Um, Be careful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm getting myself into right now, but... Um, Do we just I, email you directly, Jason? 
<laughs> um, I guess it sort of depends on how much you need. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we love being a resource that way at Hidden Villa. And so that seems like it'd be really cool. I do know also the city produces its own compost, which is by all measures, pretty good. Um, that's uh, meaning Los Altos Hills at the corner of, uh, what is Parissima. it? Parissima and, uh, um, is it? And Elena or something. Elena, Elena, yeah. Yeah, but that's um, actually supposed to only be for Los Altos Hills residents. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, I guess I'd say there's a limited quantity, um, I better say, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but please, uh, yeah, please do contact me, uh, you know, if you're a home gardener and you're interested in some uh, really good compost. Um, what was the other part of that question? It was about uh, garden bed space. Oh, uh, suburban applications for these, these things. I think really to me, one of the most exciting things that's come out of um, our experimental approach to these practices recently has been, you know, peculiar to, uh, to these deep wood chips that I'm showing in, in this picture, because we had the US Geological Survey come out uh, a couple of years ago and do a study about the carbon sequestration abilities of this tactic. And they found that there was a very large increase in the amount of long-term soil carbon as a result of this practice, um, say five years, even 10 years after, you know, we had done some of the initial applications of these deep wood chips. And what that means is that taking this raw carbon in the form of wood chips and putting it in thick layers on any ground that you have is going to be directly sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, the use for suburban areas, get wood chips and put them in your walkways. Put wood chips anywhere that you have open ground. Cover things up. That's, that's going to have a carbon sequestration effect. And it and, keeps the weeds down. <laughs> and it keeps the weeds down. And it builds moisture and it builds soil over time. There's nothing bad about mulching. It's the greatest. So uh, that brings me back to the, the question about changes in, that you're doing practices and thinking about the climate change. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, we have definitely, <laughs> definite, definitely in my opinion, um, whatever that means, uh, experienced warming here in the you know 16 years that I've been at Hidden Villa uh, to a, a noticeable effect primarily in terms of uh, on the end of the, the warmer season, more extreme drought conditions, and in the colder season, just warmer winters. Um, in the warmer winter, I mean, or generally speaking, our adjustments and ad adaptations to that have been in the form of growing more things during the winter, mm -hmm. um, trying to, uh, we've developed a lot of, uh, of tunnel systems in our fields. Um, I would definitely encourage you to do the same in your gardens at home to- uh, What's a tunnel system? Find, uh, find ways of setting up hoops uh, oh. and coverings for your garden spaces, which will extend your winter season by far. And that's not just extending the winter season, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not just extending the winter season on behalf of growing more of the vegetables that you can grow during the winter, but also to keep that ground covered. Like we, we have more of an ability for growing the cover crops that benefit our soils as a result of the warmer conditions that we're experiencing. Now, the, the inverse of that, of course, is the drought stress. And um, that has made for lots of challenges and is one of the reasons why we have increased the amount of this deep wood chip mulching that we've done is because it's a, uh, it's a way of benefiting the soil over a longer term that is compatible with a drought dry season. And it gives us the ability to have soil covered in a way that is water retentive of the water we have. Um, and it, it's, it's pretty similar to cover cropping in terms of having the soil covered and benefiting its biology over time, um, but compatible with
the drought condition. Our adaptation to that, the drought has been just literally by planting less uh, things during the drought time of year. Um, we, we do have the, mo the most state-of-the-art drip irrigation that we employ for well over 99% of our irrigation purposes here at Hidden Villa. So there's really not any, um, I, I, don't, I don't see any way that we can improve upon our water conservation. Um, I just wanted to show you guys like the, the fun pictures here too for this too. Um, just that um, in, in our thinking here, just one of the, the most uh, successful, one of the best metrics for success that we can have and, um, and just most beautiful manifestation, I think, of uh, well-practiced agriculture is just all of the animals and things that come out when you're practicing this kind of growing. And um, here we got the Western fence lizard um, who's like such a, a close personal friend of mine uh, <laughs> for, for their consumption of slugs and ticks uh, and various other um, <clears throat> pest insects. They're just, they're amazing. Um, got some turkey vultures out here in our field. Uh, they are, you know, both fantastic scavenger consumers, um, <clears throat> but also have been known recently to do quite a bit of hunting of, uh, of rodents in our field areas. Hmm. Um, Pacific tree frog. I think probably better than the Western fence lizard in its slug consumption. <laughs> Love these guys. Um, here's one of our rodent control methods. This guy has been living in our, what we call our two acre field now for about three years now. And such a handsome, I think red shoulder uh, more than the naturalist crowd, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and uh, he's just an amazing hunter or, or she, I don't know. Um, but, you know, just really, uh, really unafraid of us and, um, and just tremendous benefit to the farm in general. And we hope to the hawk. Um, <clears throat> Here's our guardians of the strawberries. Uh, Dragonfly is the most successful predator in the world in terms of their hunting abilities and successes. And just, I mean, could you be more beautiful than that? That's like <laughs> <laughs> um, super vicious for strawberry thrips. Um, earthworms are just, yeah, we, we, pretty much see them everywhere. They're the tillers of the soil, the tenders of the soil. Um, all right, well, these guys are useless. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, the, the turkeys are, uh, they're, they're pretty funny, comical, um, as is the image, um, kind of clownish in ways, but they really do, uh, they provide on one hand, like, you know, they'll, they'll damage some crops and eat them at times, but they also do just this amazing kind of scouring of the land, just walking through and, uh, and consuming insects and weeds and, uh, and, you know, various things that could otherwise be problems for us um, while leaving behind their manure gifts. <laughs> So we're getting close to the end here, Jason. I'm so, sorry to say, oh, beautiful snake. Yeah. Uh, we have, snake. do have one last question from Linda. She says, if you don't have a hawk in your backyard, what do you do about moles and gophers? Wrap them. There's Wrap just them. nothing. Yeah. I mean, I, I love talking about all these different tactics, which, you know, really provide more ecological balance and they address issues that you might have with fungi, you know, problem fungi and bacteria and insect problems and things like that. But when it comes to vertebrates, you know, if it's like crows or gophers, voles, ground squirrels, there's 
you, predators help do everything and you, at some level you just have to trap okay. or physically ex excuse me, or physically exclude them um, a lot of gardeners and i've seen many examples of uh, designs for beds that are enclosed and have hardware cloth around yeah. them okay. um, that can be really functionally uh, rodent proof very good so we're gonna have to wrap it up now this is a one hour talk and our hour is up uh, thank you so much. That was really nice. Beautiful. Uh, the next talk, by the way, coming up on Thursday is on environmental initiatives. We're going to hear from Dia Gupta with the high school green team and from Laura Texler with the Environmental Commission in Los Altos. This is an important year in Los Altos. Uh, we're going to get evaluate the climate action plan that was passed in 2013. And we'll actually find out if we're on track and come up with a new plan. And one other plug I want to make uh, the History Museum just opened a new show, Beauty and the Beast, and the photography, uh, that's the beauty part, of wildflowers in California is stunning. You really want to see that. And the beast is climate change and what that's going to do to the flowers. And there are several panels in this uh, exhibition that talk about the things that people can actually do to make a difference. So thank you again, everybody. We had a good turnout today. We had up to 46 people at one time. So that's wonderful. And uh, Stay tuned, we'll be back with more talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.